I am very, very pleased to use Damian Smart from University of Buenos Aires. Uh, we talk on whether contraclassical logics can save one from triviality by one of the Thank you very much, Miguel. Thank you, Luis Fernando, for inviting me. It is truly an honor to be here. So I honor these friends and colleagues, and some of whom I have never met before, and some of whom I, I did. So it's uh, truly an honor uh, to be part of this workshop. Speaking about a topic which I always love, but I haven't written a lot about it. So I've only one paper, um, but I always uh, try to think about this. Uh, so I'm very happy to be part of this event, something I desire uh, a few editions back, and now it's happening. So here I'm going to talk a little bit on the sort of crossbreed between the two topics that I read. One of them is uh, contra-classical logics or non-classical logics in general, and the other is substructural logics. Um, and in particular, substructural logics, which are nevertheless almost classical or classical in, in a very specific sense and in a very valuable sense, I would say. So um, my aim is basically to answer um, to the question most in the I will be uh, focusing specifically on subtractal logics um, that are non transitive So um, I, I will speak a little bit, although I will speak a little bit in the end about non reflexive logics. This is basically, uh, you know, uh, motivated by the yesterday talks by Christian and his work with the Greece. Um, I will mostly focus on non trans uh, non transitive systems. Um, Okay, so transitivity can be seen um, at least in one of its forms as this sort of rule where this arrow uh, sort of means that there is an inference there. So going from gamma and phi, you can go to delta. And, and if you can go from gamma to phi, comma delta, then you can go from gamma to delta. Of course, there are many readings of these, and I'm not imposing anything in particular here how you should read this sort of pool or meta inference or property or whatever. But I will be exploring systems which are non transitive in very specific sense, and I will try to see whether or not this helps us for the desired uh, aim. Okay, so what's our aim? Exactly that to study whether reality of strictly superclassical, so classical logic plus the, the connective thesis can be avoided by abandoning transitivity, right? So this is exactly the aim, and uh, we'll see if that uh, is good or not, and if it's good, if it's really good, or just barely making it, okay? A little bit on, on the context of discovery or how I arrived at this question, basically at this question uh, in a pub, uh, talking to Eli, we were in Costa Rica in, a, in an ASL meeting in the SLAM, South America, and sorry, sorry, the Latin American meeting. And um, I was asking her what was the involvement of transitivity in, a, in arriving at triviality uh, for the result of um, extending classical logic with the connective thesis. And we were going back and forth. And since I'm very familiar with, you know, refraining. Uh, from embracing transitivity coming from the uh, from the paradoxes literature, where you basically have classical logic, and you know that you can have um, sorry you can have a liar sentence, let's say, and have no triviality or, or have something meaningful because you refrain from having transitivity. I wonder. Well, maybe we can also do that for the case of connectivity, where you will have classical logic. You will have the relevant pieces, but you will just avoid triviality by you know, subtracting this transitive bit of the whole system. Um, of course, there are some differences from these cases, and this will be sort of important in understanding the results and the limitations of one case and another. So in the cases, in the case of the paradoxes literature, you're adding actually a token, so a single proposition. In this case, it could be a liar or it could be any other paradox. Um, so it's a constant or, or it's a single proposition, right? But in the case of, of the, the connective literature, you are adding a skew. So 
that would be seen as a sort of uh, an addition of an infinite number of single token singular propositions. So there already you have a difference, right? And uh, of course, so the, the retroactive sort of question would be, although everything is fine in this case, right? Adding a single proposition, and we will see what happens when we add a schema. Um, what will happen if we will to um, sort of study or scrutinize the case of the paradoxical um, sentences, but with schemas instead of uh, single propositions? I'm not going to talk about that, but if you're interested in other questions, talk about that in the literature, in the in the QA, right? And, and see what happens in the literature with, that, with those cases. Okay, so this is much more context for context. Let me now just go into what sort of systems I will be interested in. I mentioned non-transit systems. Proof that speaking, what I am going to be uh, looking at are systems whose associated calculate uh, doesn't have uh, a variable form of cut, right? So cut is not variable within the systems, usually presented in terms of tensor sequence calculate, of course. You can do it always. Uh, so structural natural interaction and whatnot, but you know, signal calculator are very, you know, um, gentle to expressing uh, these sort of uh, properties. And then, more theoretically speaking, um, I will look at non-transitive systems as being systems whose model theory uh, and semantics allow for models where the premises of cut may have models or may may be satisfied, but whose uh, conclusions may have uh, counter model. Okay, so it's not validity that's being preserved in the case of, of the semantics. So cut is not going to be invalid in terms of um, let's see the, these two inferences being valid and this being invalid. But in terms of these two inferences having a model and this one not. Okay, so that will be the sort of main uh, semantic uh, property that we'll be looking at. Of course, the other one is also interesting, but this is the strongest one that I picked. Okay, so these are the two um, sort of uh, ideas. And uh, again, super classicality um, in terms of the proof theory, we will look at this against the size of the and we will try to extend them um, with uh, additional value sequences. Uh, sequence, okay, so we will try to have calculate which the right or classical sequence more. And semantically, we'll try to look at an associated uh, model theory that has no for example, to the classical invalid inferences, but also you know, validates more uh, inferences, specifically in this case, the connexion. So our question reformulated should be, uh, can the connexive thesis be not really added to a non-transitive uh, calculus and also can the connected thesis be non trivially added to the model theory of an untransitive presentation of classical logic? Right? Um, we will see that the answers are positive, but there are some caveats, and, and maybe they are as positive. And this will, all, of course, resonate with something that Christian mentioned yesterday regarding P logics and connective, uh, the connectivity. So, um, okay. So maybe uh, I hope. This will uh, make this the time that uh, you devoted to building this talk worth it, anyways, because there will be some you know, uh, lessons to think about that. So, one important thing to bear in mind, at least for me, is that I ended up sort of, uh, and, I, and I was discussing this with behind me the other day, I ended up uh, sort of coming to the conclusion, which is very dear to the literature on subtractor solution to the paradoxes. That although non-transiting logics uh, seem like a novel, you know, sort of tool to attack the paradoxes and the problem of uh, triviality around naive semantic concepts, they are basically translationally equivalent to systems without model points. Uh, of course, you can resist this uh, equiparation, and this is only a comparison, and this only means that these logic stand to this sort of conception of, of what a logical system is in the same way that non transitive logics stand with regard to a logic, a set of inferences, right? That doesn't mean that 
having modus ponens is the same as having transitivity, or that not having transitivity is the same as not having modus ponens. But you can see that whatever works or doesn't work in one case has a counterpart effect in the other. And um, that, that would be very interesting to, to think about exactly what's going on in terms of the answer to the question being uh, studied in this talk. Okay. So, trigality, of course, when we're in this conception where logical systems are understood in terms of uh, relations between set of formulas and a single formula, um, means proof theoretically to derive any sequence of the form gamma, therefore delta, um, and semantically to validate for any inference of the form gamma, therefore delta, to not have a control model to any of those inferences. So, um, my sort of observation will be that non transitive logics can avoid reality um, in face of the extension of classical logic with the connexive. This is much like the non modus ponens logics can avoid reality uh, when you have all the classical theorems and you also um, have the connexive thesis. So basically, in one case, you let go of transitivity as a derivable rule or a primitive rule. In the other case, you let go of both points as a rule. Okay? And in that, in, in, in that, in doing that, you avoid triviality. Of course, you, you, you can just so so this much like is a very loose, you know, sort of uh, conceptual observation, but uh, there is some strong resemblance there that could be illuminated. But doesn't mean that you need to reduce one case to the other. So, um, so a brief justification of why um, having classical logic let, letting cut go would be would make it fun to embrace the connexive thesis. So we'll avoid triviality. Is that if you look, for example, at a non-transitive presentation of the classical logic? So that would be Jensen's. Uh, Sequence calculus delicacy without cut. So, of course, cut is a missile in that system, but it's not derivable. And um, if you are the connected thesis, you just can't, you can see, of course, that doesn't mean that there is a proof, but you can see that there's enough power to derive any sequence whatsoever. Uh, and this also uh, is true for any gamma and delta. And more theoretically speaking, you can see, and I will show you that there are models of all the valid inferences of classical logic, which can interestingly, interestingly be further restricted to validate the connexive thesis without, for example, validating any uh, sequence whatsoever. So, so that means that there are non trivial um, sort of models for, for this case. Okay, so let's. Look Proofly speaking, a sort of uh, an expansion of this justification of why it's okay to consider classical logic either as a set of theorems or, in our case, as a set of valid inferences or sequence, and then add the connected pieces as theorems, and seeing that that won't lead you to triviality, is the following. So, of course, classical logic, both axiomatically. And in the sequence calculus presentation, has let's say post complete presentations. And it's really post, it's really presentations that should be called post complete or not. It's not logic themselves, right? Because you need to look at which rules are derivable, not only admissible. So it has, of course, post complete calculi, and in particular, if you understand classical logic as a set of theorems. Certainly, if you embrace all those components and you have all the usual axioms, that will be possible. And if you have the sequence calculus and you have the cut rule, right, or primitive, then that will be possible too. But also, it has non post complete presentation, which is in, in, the, in the former case, you just have all the theorems, right? But you don't have the rule. And in the latter case, you have all the introduction rules of the sequence calculus, identity, but you don't have cut as a primitive rule. You could end up with the classical. As uh, with the classical sequence being rare, nevertheless. So, this is why you have presentations that are sort of uh, prone 
to being amicable to the, the connected thesis without leading to reality, right? So this is sort of the creating uh, insight into why this doesn't just explode all over the place. And more than theoretically, we can see the following. So classical logic, again, both as a set of theorems or just a set of formulas and as a set of valid inferences, um, so relations between sets of formulas and a formula, has two valid models, and we all know these two valid models, right? But it also has, and perhaps this is least known, uh, but, but it is, it was very discussed in the past decade or decade plus, and it has three valid presentations. And by this we mean that Consider as a set of theorems, there are three valid models for the set of theorems of classical logic, and consider as a set of valid inferences, there are three valid models for the set of valid inferences of classical logic. So, keeping in mind that you have this other way of approaching the same sort of target, in one case a set of formulas, in other cases a set of valid inferences, you can see that these three valid presentations will both uh, be, um, it will both allow for the invalidating, for, for, for invalidating in one case model exponents and in the other case class. Okay, so the three valid models will be essential in each of these conceptions for the invalidation of, uh, or for invalidating each of these rules, which otherwise would be derived of. Okay. So, Let's focus on the semantics and let me show you why, in a way at least, um, perhaps it is something that was already super well known to you, but not for me. Uh, three value models can save um, supra classical systems from the reality. Okay? So, this is a very sort of quick way of getting at that result, and it's focusing on the semantics, right? So we know that um, these three valued models of those formulas or those inferences that are in classical logic uh, can be divided into two classes, right? And this is something uh, that, that um, so a full characterization of the three valued models of classical logic was uh, at least for, for, to the best of my knowledge, absent from the literature. And recently, together with colleagues in Buenos Aires and colleagues in Paris, we have characterized those classes. And the class of three valued models can be divided into two classes. And here we're going to focus on only one of them, which is the, the monotonic models. Okay? And, and that will be clear in, in a second. So when you have three values, um, you can, of course, provide um, um, an order for those values. And this is the so called information order, just here, one half at the bottom, and then one and zero at the top, being incomparable. You have models or schemas or set of two tables or however you want to look at them that can be monotonic with regard to disorder and others that will be non monotonic. Of course, disorder generalizes to another on any area operations, uh, just component ones. Okay. So, one good example of monotonic schema is the strong clean scheme, another is the weak clean scheme. Another example of a monotonic schema is a schema that gives one half to everything and so on and so forth. Okay, good. So what we show uh, in this paper that is currently under um, review is that there's basically two classes of, um, of, of variations which give you exactly classical logic. So those, those that are monotonic are the, uh, the ones which are monotonic and also Boolean normal. And that means that for classical values, you have the classical operations. So the, the Boolean sort of results. Okay. And the other ones I will not be getting into, but they are non monotonic and they have some special properties. We can discuss that if you like. Here, we're not going to discuss them. My, my point can be proven only by focusing on the monotonic ones. Okay. So, so the idea is we have three value models for classical logic, they are monotonic and Boolean normal. Okay. And these models give you exactly classical logic. And what that means is that if you have something valid in the three valued models, it is valid in classical logic. And if you have something valid in classical logic, it is valid in this three valued model. Okay. So 
by looking into the proof, you can see in this case that monotonicity is actually the property that guarantees that whatever is valid in two value classical logic is also preserved in the three value models, right? And by that I mean if you have um, uh, if you have something that is um, invalid, right, in these three value models, uh, that means that all the premises are true and all the conclusions are false, and your schema is monotonic, then you can monotonically sort of transition into a two-value model and you will preserve the invalidity, as it were, of that given argument. So monotonicity is the, the thing guaranteeing that whatever is valid in classical logic is going to be valid here in this three-value model. So if we're going, if, if we're looking for uh, super connexive logic, so super classical logic, sorry, by adding connectivity, we, we, we are looking for systems where all the classical things are valid. So we will require monotonicity. Uh, or we can or by requiring monotonicity, we will guarantee that. Um, but we also want to have the grand synthesis. So we have to restrict the monotonic violations of the models as indicated by the connexive thesis, right? So in a way in which the models that we will end up will be models of the connexive thesis. And interestingly enough, Boolean normality, that is the other property that in the paper we look at, uh, that's the property that you actually need to let go. Because Boolean normality with regard to three valued models is the property um, just anchoring you to classical logic. So that, that doesn't let you go beyond classical logic. Boolean normality is the property that, that um, says that if something is valued in the three value model, it's going to be valued also in the two value model. But we don't want that because we want for the three value models to host the connection thesis. And of course, if they are going to be valid in the three value models, they are not going to be valid in the two value models because classical logic does not validate the connection thesis. And, and we can see that explicitly. So, um, so look at Boolean normality in the following way. Uh, I mentioned it basically preserves the two-value operations for the original two values. So if you have more tonicity, Boolean normality, Boolean normality actually guarantees the invalidity of the connexive thesis. And, and this is of course tied to uh conditions with false with false antecedents, um, which uh, I guess uh, are a uh, topic that is a topic that you know many, many scholars wants want to discuss so, uh, initial and false antecedents. And we'll see that actually is so, so some connection between how we will end up treating them here and how they are treated elsewhere is also interesting. Okay. So in order to have a proper super classical system, we need something. So we need models that are monotonic, but not necessarily Boolean normal. So for example, this is one. Right, so this is a monotonic but not Boolean normal model um, of the indication, your indication values. Okay, good. So then, the general question could be: Is there a full characterization of all the, let's say, interesting? And you see that with regard to the following comment. Um, all the interesting monotonic valuations for models or schemas or whatever that also satisfy the connexive thesis it's be like a general question okay, about models. And by interesting, I mean, well, I mean, we want these models to satisfy or to validate the connexive thesis, but we don't want these models to just satisfy anything whatsoever, of course, because of triviality, but also we want them to not validate, you know, arbitrary things, like, for example, not, not A. So, if, for example, we also let go of Boolean normality for negation, then not, not A will be a theorem, okay? And it doesn't seem that we are very much, uh, you know, committed to that by embracing the kinds of thesis, although might be the case and some of you might have a certification for that that I'm not aware of. So let's say that we focus on models that are monotonic, 
that are not Boolean normal for the conditional, but that are nevertheless Boolean normal for negation. Okay, so that basically means negation of uh, true is false, negation of false is true, and negation of one half is one half. That's the only uh, Boolean normal monotonic negation. Okay, so this is a characterization of uh, all the models, the three value models for the classically valid conditionals and the connective thesis too. Okay. And here, multiple you know, values in one cell means that you can go either way, and that would be equally as okay? certain. So you can go the weak link way, you can go the strong link way, you can go the intermediate way, doesn't really matter. Okay? And let me see. Yeah. So if I may also observe, just as a, a totally side note, uh, completely unrelated to this, that these sort of truth tables are very much related to the definitive tables of the conditional. Uh, Definetti was exploring conditional statements uh, in the wake of his preoccupation with conditional, indicative conditional with false and residuals, right? And he thought that it would, it would be very weird to have two conditionals with false and residuals because when you're making a conditional uh, assertion, or sorry, the assertion of a conditional, if the antecedent doesn't obtain, then for the conditional um, is render more or less meaningless for the void of truth value. And this, of course, complies with that. And there is some leeway for discussing the intermediate cases and, and what decisions should be made there. So just perhaps uh, some other coincidence, there is some interesting connection between the discussion uh, on indicative conditionals with false antecedents and the discussion uh, regarding you know, the models, the three value models at least for connexive uh, thesis. Okay, so basically, then this sort of picture will serve for a positive answer to our question of whether having a substructural system, especially non transitive, can lead you to a system where you have all the classically valid inferences and also the connexive thesis. So here, if you have a system that is non-transitive and you have this um, condition, any conditional uh, with making decisions in these cells, then you will have, and of course you have the monotonic and uh, and models that, uh, for the conjunction, disjunction, and negation, then you will have all the classical inferences and also your desired uh, connexive pieces. And if you look at this from a point of view of logics consists as a set of theorems, then um, by preserving, by having one and one half of the signature, you will have all the classical embedded theorems and also the connective thesis, but not both ones, of course, right? And also not other uh, rules that were only admissible and not, but, well, that, that, that were derivables or admissible, anyways. Okay, so we have an, a positive answer to our sort of original question. And uh, so, so my main concern now is how good is this positive answer? So how good is the result uh, that we arrived at? And again, perhaps all or most of what I said was already known to you. I'm not that uh, deep of a scholar into connectivity. Perhaps these were like some super well-known results in connective logics. Uh, in that case, I apologize for reiterating what might be obvious for you. But the question is now, if we have a system which is, strictly speaking, superconnected, then how good is it, right? So how good does it fare um, regarding the usual sort of benchmarks for being like an acceptable or strong enough connected system? And just to mention two, um, yeah, just two bars that you might want to see uh, if, if these uh, sort of systems Puzzle are one Kapsner strengths, so the unsatisfiability of certain uh, uh, thesis, and of course the asymmetry of the intended condition. And we'll see. So Kapsner strength really will not be present here because, as sorry, because um, as 
in as much as we need these to be valid, right? Uh, we need these to be valid when B, when A is false. Uh, and that means that we either, we either need uh, for this to be zero and these to be, so, so this to be false and this to be true, this negation to be true, or we need these to be one half and the negation to be one half. And if the negation is going to be one half, sorry, and if the condition is going to be one half, then its negation is going to be one half, and that, therefore if this one is going to be satisfied. So that's not going to, to run, and uh, of course this also you know, is reproducible for the other more, more complex Boethius uh, case. Okay, so basically, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, thank you. Um, so basically, these are the reasons uh, leading to to the um, failure of the capture of strength here. What about the asymmetry here or the symmetry uh, salary? So basically, uh, Christian thought yesterday sort of spoiled this issue uh, <laughs> because he showed very eloquently that P logics, which are basically the uh, algebraic counterpart of non transitive systems, um, make it very, very difficult, if not impossible, for the intended connexive conditional to be asymmetric or to be a proper conditional and not a high condition. So you can see it, so 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 you can see this as a sort of um, sub end to this enterprise, meaning yes, they can save you from triviality, but you will end up with something that isn't good enough, right? Or you can look at it, you can look at it other ways. So given the symmetry of the condition mm -hmm. in these non-transitive systems or, or in logics, you know. Uh, lacking those spoilers, you can also take away another conceptual uh, conclusion, which is it shouldn't be contra a supraclassicality that we should be aiming at. It should be contraclassicality, right? So supraclassicality isn't really a good thing to aim at. So the fact that we did everything we could to have a system which would comply with these requirements and we ended up with something that is not a conditional but a high condition, means that this is not something to aim at, right? There is no, no such thing out there. Um, if you are going to arrive at something, you're going to arrive at a high condition. So you better go for something which is not all the way classical and also connected, but just right with classical logic, and that's it. Uh, meaning that it is incomparable, right? And alternatively, just as a closer, let me mention that, um, and I was discussing this with, with folks uh, over lunch, that after Chris's um, talk yesterday, I was also uh, sort of hung up on other substructural properties, in particular non-reflexive uh, um, options. So of course, non-reflexive non -reflexive logics um, could also save us from triviality in, in as much as we will just um, invalidate every valid inference, and therefore we will not have models for all inferences, and we could also have uh, the connection distance as axioms, and that would be fine. But if we want to have to aim at preserving classical logic and, and still keep pushing the supra classical agenda, my question was like. So how could non-reflexive logic help us in that way? Okay, and what I came up with is this uh, admittedly hand wavy proposal, which is since non-reflexive logics are going to uh, invalidate some classically valid inference in, for example, reflexivity for propositional atoms, so P will not entail B. We could perhaps seek for a non-reflexive system that will be only non-reflexive or let's say substructural as it pertains to propositional atoms, right? And all the way um, out, so for complex formulas, actually for inferences involving only complex formulas, you will have classical logic. So the question then 
or the anchors of this talk will be what non reflexive logics, where all the classical valid inferences that involve only complex formulas be um, safe from triviality if we were able to learn the connective thesis. And my answer is that it's up to you for it to investigate <laughs> because I only have thought about it yesterday. Um, and on that note, I think I'm going to end and I'm going to thank you very much for your <laughs>
it is a um, restriction on material implication for classical logic because everything that's going to be valid with regard to this is going to be valid for material implication in classical logic. Sorry, uh, the other way, everything that is valid for material implication in classical logic is going to be valid for disconnected. So it is, in a way. So, uh, therefore, I was uh, yes. really still irritated because yes. it is not the question of connectivity that not uh, a rising connection with material implications, but everybody knows that material implications absolutely are connected. Uh, so, instead of considering the odds and the seasons, which we have talked about yeah. today, the interesting point is impossible to see, but it's yeah. about what you have in mind. Exactly. Yes, yes. No, this is not what I had in mind, although that could be also interesting to, to observe and to think about exactly what, what sort of inferences or perhaps rules will be um, attacked by that. But yes, I realized that, for example, one could also start from a different uh, point of view or embrace a different project, namely one perhaps closer to the previous presentation, where you have your material implication, and then you add a new arrow. You say, this is the connective. connective. Um, can we make it? To have all the classical things and also the the connective uh, properties, uh, and that will be like you know approaching it like from the bottom up sort of. Uh, here I just granted material implication and said, can we add stuff to material implication without reaching sort of a breaking analog point? Um, the answer was yes, but. Uh, and I'm sorry for that, but yes, I have to be honest. Uh, we have a question in Zoom. Okay. Of Carson. Yes, please, please. Not. Not. Yes. Three minutes ago, he was raising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I was clapping. Um, <laughs> it wasn't a hand. <laughs> it was a very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to <laughs> say. Professor, hi. Could we go back to the yes. slide with the takeaways? Yes. Yes, so I mean, uh, yes, the symmetry of the conditional is not going to be what makes the analysis problem. Uh, but isn't it the failure of most problems for me? <laughs> I mean, uh, so there are these complaints about LP. So we find uh, the conditional uh, is not really conditional. So there are attempts at adding some of this value. Yes. So yes. Um, what would you say? Yes, yes. Uh, So here, perhaps, is one instance where this sort of com this comparison that I made between non corresponding logics and non transitive logics um, can come apart or can come down. So, in as much as we are discussing a condition, um, it truly is very problematic to say that you have a condition which satisfies all the classical things and also the connective thesis, but it doesn't have. <laughs> The most inherent property of being a conditional, which is modus one. Uh, whereas in the case of non transitive systems, uh, it has all the classical things, it has the connective things, it has modus ponens, but certainly it's an equivalent. Uh, so here, maybe, I know, but I mean, it, it, this could be contested. Uh, and perhaps I'm not doing a service to myself right now because. I'm also advancing uh, an objection to this, but you, you both also contest that although you have modus ponens internally, you don't have the you don't have the modus ponens rule. Meaning, if A is theorem, B is A will be theorem, theorem. So I guess there's always a reply to the, your sort of answer. But in in short, perhaps this is one point where these two options come apart. Thank you. Yes.
Christian, please. Thank you for inviting me. When you recover the classicity, is because you recover the theorems and the parameter groups. So, okay, but I believe that it is not now enough it's because um, I believe that the, the recover to all the arguments too is necessary for have the classical logic, you know? Yes. And the question is, don't you think that there are some connexive meta-arguments or meta-inference yeah. yeah. and that we will lose yeah. them by recovering so much classic things? Yeah, uh, I, I I see what, what you mean. Um, I think that at this point, I took it at face value what the literature sort of pushes. And every time you try to just give theorems, right? The connection logic, if you have these theorems, and you have the symmetry and whatnot, et cetera, et cetera, but just focus on theorems. Um, I mean, that if you were to focus on meta arguments or meta inferences or sort of transitions between inferences as being characteristic of a connective system, um, yeah, surely something will be lost. Um, in the P logics, so in the non transitive systems. And that's why I'm also very interested about the Q logics, so the non reflexive ones, right? Um, so, Heinrich and Daniel uh, wrote about these and they favor in, in that occasion uh, connectivity as being characterized by, let's say, these yeah, meta logical properties or meta, you know, meta arguments or meta inferences. Um, and that could be also perhaps the way to go. Um, interestingly enough, that will not mean focusing on supra systems, but just on you know, systems that are different from. Um, so my answer would be, if you are going to focus on meta things, then do not bother about adding the axioms. Yes. And if you are uh, adding the axioms, do not worry about the meta arguments. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, that's how we see. Thank you. Yes. Is there anyone else? Hello. Well, um, I do not think this can like uh, recommendation, but because I think uh, this is pretty neat. Um, as you correctly say, perhaps some of this uh, material has already been presented in one form or another, yeah. which is why I think you should carry on with this. Just, I mean, the starting point, for instance, is that um, one of the matrices that you chose has actually been presented already. Yes, of course. Uh, but there is a wide variety. Yeah. Of uh, proposals for connected logics presented uh, model theoretically yeah. using three valued matrices and which uh, attempt to recover uh, some classicalities. So in, it would be interesting to see like a finer distinction to figure out whether it all boils down to the same thing. Right? Perhaps that. Uh, they end up behaving one way rather than another. It's more a matter than uh, of the reading of the matches it looks over. But like structurally, what's happening, it all boils down to the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that observation. I mean, I guess another way in which you could approach this following your suggestion would be to start with a with a with only the so it would be like closer to what Tomas was was presenting, right? It's just, Start with the connective matrices. Yeah. Give you just arrive at matrices, uh, if you can, for negation and conditional, and then you know keep asking properties of that connective. So, for example, ask for those products, ask for the invalidity of the symmetry, the condition, and then keep restricting your 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 matrices until you arrive at something. Yeah. Um, yeah, that could be one way to go. Uh, I know if this has been explored or not, I know this next week. I think, that. I think uh, what I like the most about it is that it gives a perfectly reasonable explanation. I people that you were asking me about 
uh, discussions on whether the conditional is really a conditional and yeah. not a conditional. Yeah. And I was able to point like Converstone, yeah. really angry criticism as well. Yes. I said, well, you do uh, take your collection of uh, connectives and then make sure that no substitution kills um, classically valid principles. Yeah. And so I think this is a neater, like more detailed, yeah. uh, clear explanation of what's going on and how one arrives at the conclusion that um, it may be important to explain whether this is actually a connective more like a conditional rather than um, a condition. Yeah, yeah. And another thing in connection with your first uh, observation is that here I focus on these sort of sets of truth tables um, that I'm sure I've seen in papers by, well, the well-known politicians in the connective tradition. There are other many, there are many, many other uh, truth tables that will also yeah. be the connective things uh, stemming from the, the, the semantics for the three value semantics for classical logic, which are they not monotonic? Yeah, because I was thinking, like, the thing that immediately immediately came to my mind was that perhaps there is some parallels between this and what Hitoshi did. It was, yes. it was taking, like, LP. Exactly, yeah. And just adding exactly. uh, the next species. But that was done from exclusively a uh, monotheoretic point of view. Yes. So it's really nice to have, like, the other side of the point as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is true. Thank you. Somebody else? A quick comment, at least um, in connection to Ellie's comment. Um, three value logics or uh, presentations of logic, um, which have seen that value that connects the faces, but also go structural more in the relevant logic way. Yeah. Uh, do retain modus phonics. Yeah. But usually uh, they lose monotonicity. That's mm -hmm. something which, which fails. Uh, when you treat this kind of matrices, it's something which fails like, uh, a lot. So, I mean, I don't know if, if the non monotonic uh, part of your work, which you do a bit more percent, yeah. would have something to do with those systems, which I mean, they are transitive, right? And yeah, and detachable additional cells so working there. But I do believe that monotonicity has uh, to be studied a little bit more in, in this yeah. in this discussion because there are things happening uh, in both sides of the uh, the, the, the research we're, we're we're addressing here. Um, no, some things may have to be discussed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just to be clear here, by monotonicity, what they're referring in to? Our original, yeah. So what you mean? What that does? That an arrow uh, to which you add uh, and have. Uh, New column gen exactly will yes. fail. Yes. 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 Here that won't be the case okay. in any of the models, either the monotonic or the non monotonic, because they will present exactly what you have in classical logic. Mm -hmm. So they will give you exactly classical logic plus the kinds of things. So right. not the monotonic in this order theoretic semantic sense, nor the non monotonic. So neither of them will invalidate those sort of that sort of property of the condition, mm -hmm. at least not in you know inference form, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. So if A R O B as a premise, then A and C R O B mm -hmm. as a conclusion, that would be perfectly valid yeah. in all of the three valid models, the ones that I'm presenting here and the ones that I didn't present. Maybe that would fail in a meta argument form. Uh, haven't thought about that, but could be the case. Could be the case. I would not surprise Yes. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Have a couple of minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.